we've done a, a couple of lessons on homosexuality and uh, generated a lot of interest and opened some questions as to the biblical characters uh, and what was being insinuated in the Bible concerning the, the sexuality of, of uh, different, you know, characters in it. And tonight we'll talk about the question of pedophilia, child abuse, we'll talk about uh, sexual perversion, because of the fact that this is an energy that is strong in every living thing, not just uh, human beings, it's, a, it's an energy that is strong in all that lives. And it's an amazing thing. Um, religion has been able to convince us that it doesn't exist on a social level, and yet when we are out of the grasps of the um, religious, we know that within ourselves it does exist. And even them, I mean, you know, the preachers who say this is evil, but then put on their bandanas and shower slippers and jump over the fence and head for the motel because they hear the, the call of the wild, <laughs> as uh, Jack London used to call it. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like the wolf up on the mountain, oh, you know, and somebody's got to answer. <laughs> And it doesn't make any difference how religious you are, there is this energy, and you have it, and you have to respond to it. And of course we have uh, created a whole age of young people who we've almost single-handedly destroyed by not allowing them even to discuss the question. We, we march in front of abortion clinics and say it's evil, but at the same time we also don't allow discussions of contraception um, or um, you know, how to get along with one another in a sexual way. Uh, responsibly. So you can't have it both ways. Um, and, and like we were, we were talking, there's a situation here in, in this area, if you're watching on television, a young girl who just had a baby, her parents didn't know she was pregnant, she strangles the baby and dumps it in a plastic bag and puts it in the closet. What would have been better? Would it have been better if the child had had proper instructions, the young girl? And I think the, even the baby would have been so much better off under that circumstances that the inception to have been aborted than to have been subjected to that. So these are terrible, terrible questions. And we're, you know, the, uh, Malcolm X used to have a statement which I think we're, we're seeing that, and that's the chickens come home to roost. You, you build something and you're going to pay for it. And people can look around and say, well, you know, what's going on? What's happening to this world? Nothing. We're just reaping what we've sowed, that's all. And uh, by denying the reality of the sexual energy in all of us, we, we are reaping the, the, the revolution of it and the, and the hardness of it. Neither homosexual persuasion nor heterosexual persuasion indicates sexual depravity or morbid behavior. Neither side. Homosexual behavior, heterosexual behavior does not indicate morbid behavior. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. The same things that go on between homosexuals go on between heterosexuals. I don't want to get graphic here. I don't intend to get graphic here. If you want, we can discuss it later. But let me just say that that's a fact. Okay. The same things that go on between homosexuals go on between heterosexuals. We have to be mature enough to understand this. So the, the mere fact that the relationships of, of one group uh, or another group does not in any way uh, inst uh, say, well, this group is morbid and this group is fine because these groups are heterosexuals. They do everything the right way and this is homosexuals. They do everything the wrong way. Not so, okay? There's fable number one that we ought to uh, put out of the way. There's a lower aspect of both homosexuality and heterosexuality and of lesbianism and that lower aspect is a problem called multiple partners. All right. It doesn't make any difference from which persuasion you come. Multiple partners is a problem and it's the problem where disease comes and where disease spreads and it's simply a case of irresponsibility. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a case of a lack of training, it's a case of a, a lack of a lot of things, uh, but, you know, we, we, we have this drive, nobody tends to this drive, nobody pays any attention to this drive, we bring little kids into Sunday school, little kids have this drive, we have little girls in their communion outfits and coming up the aisle to get Holy Communion, they may have a sexual stimulation within them, and we can't even conceive of such a thing, but nonetheless it's true! Does it make any difference if they're 12 or 13? They have this thing within them. And mother and father who can go out at any time they want, it's very easy to turn around and say, now don't ever think of such a thing as they close the door and go into the chambers to get on with it, you know? And they leave little Lori standing out somewhere or little Marie or little George and nobody, and just don't think of such a thing. 
knowing full well that it's impossible because it's a natural thing. And this natural thing that drives within everybody is God-given, God-created. It's done by nature. There are those who say today, and I've had a, I had a fundamentalist minister write me and tell me that AIDS was a punishment against homosexuals. And they said the exact same thing about venereal disease until it was found that God's punishment could be short-circuited by penicillin. Once penicillin came, that was the end of God's punishment, so we didn't get that anymore. And one day AIDS and this virus will be conquered. And then it will no longer be, something else will be God's punishment. Because it's just ignorance. We live in dark ages mentality. Religion is stupid, ignorant, dark ages mentality. And how we can sit and listen to this crap is beyond me. How we can even tolerate the stuff coming into our houses with these people making these types of declarations. They are totally ignorant, have no idea whatsoever what they're talking about from a scientific standpoint, yet we take it into ourselves. And you get ministers sitting down and saying, AIDS is God's punishment against homosexuality. Then who is he punishing with infant death? syndrome? Who is he punishing with multiple sclerosis? Who is he punishing with cancer? Who is he punishing with muscular dystrophy? And if this is his idea, then he's the biggest pervert of all. God! You know. We don't even, like we said this morning, we don't even know his name. Whoever he is. I get upset with this kind of stuff, you know, because you can just look at the destruction of this magnificent planet of all its culture, of all its ecology, you can lay it right at the doorstep of prejudiced people, hard-nosed people, who are totally ignorant, and these people are a dark age mentality which comes out of Europe at a time when they weren't allowed even to question, and they still aren't, and so they can come up with stupid things like this. There is a, a, a psychial drama that unfolds itself, and, and then, you know, these, this is the reality, what I'm about to say. It. There are males, okay, there are males who are repulsed by females. There are females who are repulsed by males. And there are heterosexuals who are repulsed by somebody of the same sex. That's the way it is! You know? I mean, wake up, everybody. This is the way it is. And you would have asked Shakyamuni Buddha a couple of thousands of years ago, so what the heck is this? He would say to you what? Such is the nature of things. Such is the nature of things. But the problem here is if you get religious people who concoct their own interpretation of this book and say, oh, this is evil, this is a sin. And yet it is rampant and always has been. You know the problem? We lived in such a shell. We live in such a shell that you think that all the stuff you're reading in the newspapers is 1990. What is this world coming to? And yet this stuff was rampant and always has been rampant. Aristotle. Do you ever hear of Aristotle? This is a brilliant person. One of the most brilliant persons whose name has ever touched the annals of history. Aristotle. Let's write his name down in case you want to look at it. Nobody, is there anybody more brilliant or well, more well-known than Aristotle? I mean, if you're, a, you know, you talk about Aristotle, you really know what you're talking about. Aristotle advised men to engage in boy love in order to hold down the population explosion. He suggested it. This is the way he said to hold down the population explosion. Go out and get yourself a little boy. That was Aristotle. This wasn't, some, this wasn't some guy from the Man Love Association or whatever these crazy things. This is Aristotle. The Greek, you know, high-class philosopher, Aristotle. There was a point talked about in the Bible in which women used to make an orgy with themselves out of implements from the temple, they used to masturbate with these implements from the temple, and it's recorded in the Bible. You want to see it? Would you like to see it? Certainly you would like to see it. I told you you're here. Okay. Go to page 689, Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, and look at verse 17. You have taken your fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I've given you. You made to yourself images of men, and you commit whoredom with them. That's what it means. 
There is a book written by Plato. I know you've heard of Aristotle. How many of you have heard of Plato? There is a book written by Plato called Lasis. You want to look it up? L-Y-S-I-S. -S. Written by Plato of Greece. Joan, you studied Plato, Philo, Aristotle. This is what Plato says. <coughs> it speaks plainly of the physical love of a man for a boy. What? Think of something here. You, you're being shocked about this from ancient Greece. That's where your Bible comes from. That's where your Bible was translated. That's where the interpretations come out of Greece. And Plato spoke of the physical love of a man for a boy. And why I'm telling you this is to try to set the record straight of those who think pedophilia is something that originated in the 1990s. It hasn't. Here's a shocker for you. And you can see how these things were handed down from the ages past. In Greek, in ancient Greece, of which your Bible came from, boy love was the privilege of the elect. In other words, it was permitted for those who were free, the knights, and all of the hotshots. There were strict rules that kept the practice illegal to slaves and the lower classes. But if you were in the upper class, you could have your own boy for sex. And so when you see these things, you say, what is this world coming to? I'm talking about ancient Greece at the time that your Bible was being put together. Boy love in ancient Greece was fostered and approved by the state. The government said it is a wonderful, harmless way of people fulfilling their sexual desires and holding down the population explosion. In Crete, there's a country there called Crete, C-R-E-T-E. -E. The male would advise the boy's parents of his intention to take their son. If the parents disliked the arrangement, they could work and go before the magistrate to stop it. But if the person was of a high stature, the parents always capitulated and said, this is wonderful. And after the boy would have an affair with this man, the boy would be sent back to his parents bearing gifts. So common was the practice that it was considered unfortunate if a knight did not have a boy lover. You just weren't a knight. You, you weren't of the aristocracy unless you had a little boy with you to make love to. Do you understand this? This is the basis, this is the basis of your Bible. This is where, this, this is, these are the people that, that were the, the, the ones who, who put this together, come out of the Greek. This was going on. So, then comes religion. There's a place called Thebes in Greece. You ever hear it? T-H-E-B-E-S. In Thebes, there is a monument that goes to this day, and it says, on this holy place, under the protection of Zeus, Cryon has consummated his union with the son of Bathycles, and proclaiming it proudly to the world, and many Thebians have united themselves with their boys on this same holy spot. Okay. I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that this at that time took upon itself the, the credibility of not only the government, but of religion. This was an accepted practice. There were two Roman emperors. First one, I sure you, you'll know. I don't probably even have to write his name. First one's name is Nero. The second one's name is Heliogopolis. H E L I O G A B A L U S. What was different about these two emperors of Rome? They dressed as women. They dressed as women, and they promoted male lovers to high places in the government. They were homosexual. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that you'll never find that you can confirm that Jesus said that there was a David, that there was a Solomon. But there is records of Mark Anthony. And Mark Anthony wrote in his records that Julius Caesar adopted a young fellow by the name of Octavius into his house. And Octavius repaid for this great privilege with homosexual acts. Julius Caesar, Octavius, 
at you too, Brutus, and all of this kind of business. So now we come to the question of altar boys. I was an altar boy for a half hour. <laughs> they taught me this stuff, and they said, you'll be here at 6 o'clock. I am never anywhere at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so I never made it. I know I missed the first one, and uh, they yelled at me and when I showed up. Anyhow, I didn't show up that often to get yelled at, but uh, that was a shocker to them because they thought they had me converted. We hear of um, a shocking thing that goes on today of, of religious people who are having sexual relations with boys, and in some instances right next to the altar in, in churches. There was a saint of the Catholic Church named Francis, and he records this, quote, Priests have sexual relations with young boys, but they assert it is no sin. They said that sexual indulgence with women was for them a serious sin, but the relationship with boys was harmless and even commendable. I never knew that when I was going through my escapades. <sighs> There's some interesting things when you, when you look at this, and we'll, then we'll get to a little, a little scripture. But There's a remote area of Alaska, and in 1800, a Russian traveler named Daidow, D-A-W-Y-D-O-W, lived among the Kenyagas tribe in Alaska. What was different about these is that there were men who had tattooed chins, and they worked only as women. They lived among the women, and they took male husbands unto themselves. The only way you could tell that they were different is they had a tattoo on the chin. I, God knows it doesn't say what the tattoo said, but I, you can imagine. So they used, to take, they used to take male lovers unto themselves, and they would live right next door to you. They did all the housework, and they did all the cooking and the darning and whatever they did in, in those parts of Alaska, and that's what they did. So what I'm saying to you, there's a remote culture. It's not something that's exposed to 42nd Street in New York. It's in a remote place of Alaska where a Russian traveler came upon this tribe that was living in all of these huts, and they had these guys that would tattoo their chins, move in next door to, quote, unquote, a normal couple, and it would be two guys, and they would set up house. They would get married. And, oh, you know, what do you, tell, what do, you do with this? Is the Jerry Falwell going to come there to have him for lunch? They were called Aknukshiks. This is a good one. A C H N U T S C H I K S. Tattoos on the chin, and the boyfriend comes in, they get married, and off they go. And I'll tell you something the guy who got married to one of these was envied. <laughs> I'm married to a woman. Oh, man. I'm married to an octa chicks. <laughs> Whoa! I'm telling you. Did you, do you ever go, do you ever read about this stuff? Is this nothing fascinates you? Is it, did you, you read this stuff. This is, a, this is very fascinating. Because these are not, these are remote people that do this. Everywhere in the world there were classes of people who were different. There's an island in the Bering Straits. And the place is called K-O-E-K-C-U-C. K-O-E-K-C-U-C. Probably never heard of it. I never heard of it. But it's an interesting place. These people were magicians, dream interpreters, and they all wore women's clothes. They all wore women's clothes. You know, you, see, you go to Key West and you see some guy come down the street in high heels. You know, with an evening gown on. Say, hey, this is Key West. No, this is Cook a Duck. Absolutely normal in Kukaduk. Here she comes down the street. Is it a she? Is it a he? They were considered male wives. And they wore women's clothes. There were people, uh, there's a book called Sacred Dottle Celibacy. That one you ought to try to get your hands on. Let me spell it for you. S-A-C-R-E-D-O-T-A-L, celibacy. 
and it details sexual perversion amongst the clergy, which flourished through every rank of the church hierarchy. In all aspects of Christianity, this was recorded, sexual perversion. I mean the priests and the ministers who come out and bless you, preach hellfire and brimstone, and then get all involved in all kinds of stuff. The priest or the minister would come off of the platform, the church service is over, stand at the door, wish you God's blessing, then go put on his dress and hook up with the boys, or the girls, or whatever they were. There was a person named Arnolfo, you can look that up if you'd like to, A-R-N-O-L-F-O, A-R-N-O-L-F-O. Arnolfo, who made such a claim against sexual perversion within the clergy, was killed, silenced. Couldn't deal with Arnolfo. But you know what's interesting? Let me show you how you can prove this in Christianity especially the sexual perversion, the problem. Whenever there's smoke, you know, when I, whenever I, when I was a manager in the cable system and when we would be suspicious that somebody was doing something because something started missing or whatever, one, I remember one fellow um, assistant saying to me, you know, there's smoke, there's usually fire. Okay? Think something for a minute. How long have you been Christians all of your life? Okay? Think for a minute. We're talking about sexual perversion tonight. And we're talking about sexual perversion among the clergy, sexual perversion in the church. Isn't it amazing? Have you ever thought about the fact that the most holy day of the Christian calendar, alleged to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, is actually a day to celebrate sexual perversion and prostitution of all forms? And it's called Easter. Think about that. Easter, from the ancient places of Babylon, was actually a day to celebrate that which was the female sexual experience, prostitution, all kinds of sexual perversion that went on in the temple. I, I just want you, you know, you people here, you people in tell them, maybe write me, tell me why. Tell me why the, the church decreed this day. Why not Arbor Day or Flag Day or, uh, you know, George Washington Day or something? Why Sex Day? Why Sex Day to be your holy day? Is any, if anybody has any ideas, you know. Because, I mean, there are all types of days. If you're the church hierarchy, you could have selected all kinds of days to say this is the day we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Why did you pick a day that was specifically geared towards sexual perversion? And it is. I, I, one part of it I know is that the church could not deal with the Jewishness of Passover, so we eliminated it. But why? What was being... See, where well, there's smoke, there's fire. Do you see the perversion? Do you see there's something wrong? Do you see that there is something wrong deep within the consciousness of the church and its members when, for whatever reason, they take a day that is supposedly the most holy day and replace it with a day that is dedicated to sexual perversion and prostitution. And that's your, that's your, that's your Christian day. That's your holiest Christian day. There's so much, that's, so much that is sexual overflowing in all of the religions and the religions of Christianity and, and Judaism, so much of it. I'm going to tell you something that's going to be a little shocking to you here. If any of this other stuff hasn't shocked you, this may, okay? Is there some, uh, is, there, is that okay? Okay. Uh, history shows that Judea was filled with phallic worship. Do you know what phallic worship is? Okay, phallic worship is the worship of the male sexual organ, the penis, okay? Actually, uh, as I've told you before, and this is a fact, the lore and the mythology of Isis and Osiris is that when Osiris died and they cut his body up into 14 parts, Isis made a bronze of uh, Osiris' penis and said, sent it to all of the temples and said this must be placed in the most prominent place of the temple, and it was. And it is to this day, and that's what the steeple is. And that's the way it goes. So that should thrill you as you drive by and see that uh, Osiris is quite a guy in his time. <laughs> Phallic worship was a paramount part 
of religion. The word genesis and genitals are the same. It means that which is the origin of things. Okay? Everything in that Bible is, is based in one way or the other about sex. And it's interesting. In Matthew 16, 18, you don't have to look this up, but I'll give this to you, and it might be a little difficult for you to take, but nonetheless, if you have ears, fine. Jesus refers to Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S, by the name Peter. Both Peter and Cephas are Old Testament names that mean the penis, the male sexual organ. In fact, if I don't want to get too graphic or too funny about it, but many today refer to the male sexual organ by the same name as this great hero of the New Testament. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> so what do we say is the biblical kind of sexual perversion which downtrods women any better than the other forms? What's the Bible really trying to say? Let's do a little Bible thing, which I think is, is very interesting. It shows that the stories are not literal, and of course there's a whole bunch of, 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 of things in here that when, when I see the, the literalists approach the Bible from a literal standpoint, uh, I always find it to be um, you know, amazing, especially in this. Let's go to page 14, Genesis chapter 19, and... Uh, We'll run this out, and then we'll be done. But I want to show you some two interesting things, okay? And maybe if you can look with me, uh, it will help you. Let's draw a line down here, and let's look at Genesis 19, first of all. Genesis 19. And in Genesis 19, verse, uh, we're on page 14. Genesis, for those of you who are out there, Genesis chapter 19 and verse uh, 3. This is a point where Lot is our hero, and he is in Sodom and Gomorrah, or one of these places, and he's in there with a couple of angels. And it says in verse 3 that they went into his house. In verse 4 it says, but before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, compassed the house. In other words, they came around the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. Okay? And it says then in verse 5, and they said a lot, where are these men that you have? Send these men out. Okay? So first of all, what do we have? We have the uh, selected inside the house, okay? We have the men of the city, and they, they want, send, send the men out. Going to have some good times, a hot time in old Sodom tonight, okay? Send, send the men out. Okay, now, in verse 7, it says, Oh, I pray you, brother, do not do so wickedly. Lot shut the door, and he said, look, Verse 8, I have two daughters. Now, this is God's chosen guy. I have two daughters, two daughters, which have not known men. Okay? Now, one of the things that you've always heard, okay, was that, you know, this whole Sodom and Gomorrah thing was homosexual. Now, if it was all homosexual, I mean, a lot would have known that the two daughters were not going to do it, you know. But anyhow, he had two daughters. And he says, I'll send them out, and you do to them whatever you want. Can you imagine this? God's chosen guy. This is the, this is the only guy that passed the test. This was the only nice guy in the whole town. And he's going to send his two daughters out to, uh, to have sex with the whole town. And you do whatever is good in your life. Now look at verse 9. And they said, stand back. This one fellow came in, and he will need to be judged. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. They br almost broke the door. Okay. All right. So that's Genesis 19. Now, did that really happen? It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Here you got our hero, our biblical hero, inside the house with, um, with his angels. The men of the city come around the house. And they say, send these guys out, send these angels out. The angels are in there eating lasagna, and they got, you know, tomato sauce under wings and everything, and they look like them. I said, oh, no, I got two daughters, I'll send them out. And they come in, and they almost break the door down, saying, hey, you know, get out of there. And, and, and that's, yeah, that's the story. It's an interesting story. And it's, of course, you yeah, know, this is, this is literal. You know. I want you to turn to page 229, okay, and look at something with me. Go to page 229. On, on page 229, you'll come to Judges. 
uh, these stories, incidentally, have deep metaphysical, deep spiritual meanings to them. You'll come to Judges. And you'll come to Judges chapter 19, okay, page 229. Now, this is a story, look at me for a minute, let me just set this up for you. This is a story, Judges. This is a story about a Levite. You know what a Levite was? A Levite was one of those guys who worked in the sanctuary. They were the trusted ones who worked in the sanctuary. He's got a concubine. You know what a concubine is? A concubine is, 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 is a wife, but not really of the first order. She's kind of a lower class wife. Yeah, you, you get a little tired of uh, wife, uh, bring the other wife. Yeah, you're a concubine. You know, that means in case things go wrong, I just kick you out. The other one I got some responsibility to, but this, this is it. This is God's chosen people. <laughs> this is the word of God, you know. I mean, this is good stuff. So our chosen people. Anyhow. What happens is this girl kind of got fed up. She got fed up. She went home to daddy, concubine, went home to pa. The Levite, he went after her. He liked her. She was, a, she was all right. She was a nice kid. He went over to get her back. He stayed with pa for five days. So there's, there's all mystical implications in this. Every day he was going to go, no, stay. I, I'll go tomorrow, no, stay, and it went on for five days in the course, and that has to do with the chakras and all this stuff. But we're just literalizing this, okay? I want you to look at Judges chapter 19, where you are, and look at um, verse uh, 20. Here's an old man comes, and he sees this guy with his concubine and his servant. There's another guy here, the servant. So we have the Levite, his concubine, and his servant, and they're sitting in the street because they can't, they've been touring around, they're on their way back from the father, so can't find any place, nobody lets them in. So here's the old man says, look, let thy wants lie upon me. In other words, I'll take care of you. Don't lodge in the street. I don't want you to stay in the street. Come on, Levite, you, this wench, and the servant, come on to my house, to my house. So I'm going to have a nice time. Come on. Okay, we'll come over to your house. I don't want to bust up, I'll come over your, I'll come over your house and we'll have a good time. Yeah, okay, no problem. Interesting. Okay, we'll stay in the street. Look at verse 22. They get in their house and they're making merry. I love it. Behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat on the door and said to the old man, bring forth the man that came into your house that we may know him. Familiar? Huh? Bring him out so we may know him. I want you to look at verse 23. What does our hero say here? <sighs> look, my brethren, I pray you, do not do so wickedly. See it? When you see something like that, tell these screwballs in these churches, this is not literal. There's a point being made. There's a very deep, mystical, metaphysical, spiritual statement being made here. Don't do so wickedly. Now, here we go to verse 24. Look, here's my daughter and a concubine. I'll bring them out now, and you humble them. In other words, do whatever you want. No matter how perverse it is, humble them. Do whatever you want, but don't do such a vile thing to this man. Okay? I cannot understand, ladies. I really, I would, don't, don't look at me because I was a revolutionary. I'm not going to accept any of the guilt. I was a revolutionary. I walked out of this church school stuff when I was a kid. And I cannot understand how women could ever walk into these churches and sit down. I cannot understand it. The degrading stuff that was put upon women and have you walk in and sing these damnable songs and contribute to it is beyond me. I really cannot understand it. If anything was put upon women, and if there is such a thing as the devil, and he was certainly the author of this, and it's happened in this country and in all the countries in the world where women have been absolutely subject to the most terrible degrading and, and destruction by religion. Here is my daughter. Do with her whatever you want to do. Verse 25, it says, the man took his concubine, this is our, this is this kid. You remember now, this girl left this guy. She couldn't, she couldn't deal with this. 
Now he takes her by the hand and leads her outside to have sex with the town. And look what it says. It gets a little more graphic here. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Where was our heroes? Our Levite, who takes care of the sanctuary. He's inside sleeping, drinking, having a party, while this girl is being raped for eight, ten hours in the streets. This is the literal part of this book. And you know what's interesting? They want this in the school so the kids can study this. We've got to have Bible study in the school. Uplift our children. Oh, yeah, it can be. Uh, but, you know, some other time we'll go into this, to the mystical part of it. I don't have time. This is all, this, this never happened, folks. This never happened. But the literalists who take this literally, you know, can excuse this. You know why? Because I'll dare say this. You have never gone to a church where they've read this stuff to you. Because they don't have the guts to read it to you. So they took her and then came, when the, in verse 27, in the dawning of the day, she came back to the house. She fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And this guy rose up, verse 27, opened the doors of the house, went out to go his way, and behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold, probably trying to crawl back to the house of God's chosen people where I'm sure they had a Bible study all night. And what did he say? Any compassion? Any sorrow for this degrading thing? Look at verse 28. Get up, let's go. But it said she never answered. Then he took her upon an ass donkey and went to his place. Ready for this one? Look at verse 29, folks. And when he came into the house, he took a knife, he laid hold on his concubine, and he divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coast of Israel. Each of the 12 tribes got a piece of Martha. <laughs> and it was so. You know, Seth, let me tell you something, folks. If you saw this in a... In a porno magazine or something, you'd be picking in the place that they should close the place down. You know? I have, I have never known, and I've, I've seen lots of Playboy magazines, I have never, ever, ever known of a time when a Hugh Hefner would ever have stooped to any kind of a thing like this, this holy book of God's chosen people. There's an interesting thing in the very last sentence of this which lays the metaphysical aspect of it. The last sentence says, consider this, take advice, and speak your mind. We'll go into that at another time. But if you want to be a literalist and a fundamentalist and take the Bible literally, then there is a disgusting, violent, and sexual put-down of women. And I find in all the laws, in all the laws, my friends, that we discussed tonight, and look as you may in all of your laws of Leviticus and all of this stuff, there is not one law that addresses sexual abuse of children. Praise the Lord. Not one. And sexual abuse of children has gone on since the creation of time. And it's not addressed. And it's not addressed by the church today. Never has been. I don't even think they're allowed to say the word S-E-X in their meetings because they don't acknowledge that it exists. Real quick, the man is the mind, the wife in this case is the lower spirit, the servant is the ego, and the spirit leaves when your spirit is left, it's broken, and you are left with only that which is the ravings of the mind. You seek it, you remain the five days, which means you raise yourself to the fifth chakra. And you enter the house of the old man. In other words, you go back into that place of your old ways. And your spirit then is abused by the system. Your spirit is dead. And then what you do, you separate that unto 12, which is perfection. 
and then you give it all unto that which is Israel, which is the joining of the spirit and the mind to the understanding of that which is the God force which is within. It is a very deep metaphysical myth that we read. But I gave it to you literally to show the nonsense of taking this stuff literally. The exact same story was the Sodom and Gomorrah story as was this story, word for word, copied, exactly the same. And yet these people will stand and say, I believe every word in this Bible because they're ignorant. Only ignorance would allow somebody to say that. As if you really look at it and you really research it, this stuff is copied time and time and time again. Because a point is trying to be made. A spiritual point is trying to be made. And this perversion that happened in, 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 in Greece and in the ancient times and in the early points of the church that has never been dealt with is prime evidence of what, a, what happens when you take something that is totally normal, make it into an evil, and then not allow people to discuss it or deal with it or understand it. It's a horror, and we've created a horror. And I don't even know, except for the fact of the power of Aquarius, I don't think anything can be done. It's way beyond the point of being able to do anything about it. The church is, a, is, is a, not, a, not a failure because they did anything, didn't do anything about it. They, they're a failure because they caused it. Women have been degraded not in spite of religion, but because of religion. Not just in this country, in all religions. It's a disgusting commentary on tribal mentality. And we were talking at lunch today, and I said, we were talking about different Deepak Chopras and different John Bradshaws and so forth and so on, and all wonderful people. But I said, I always cling to probably my favorite was this strange man from Switzerland named Carl Jung, because Carl Jung addressed the problems of the world as a product of the tribal mentality. And he said that the only salvation comes when people become individuals and begin to understand themselves and take responsibility for that which is within themselves. So what did we accomplish? We accomplished the fact that this is old news, nothing new. All of this has happened time and time and time again. Sexual perversion on the part of the clergy is old news. Boy love is old news. Child abuse is old news. It's always been. The only difference was that in sometimes and in some places and probably to this day, it's condoned by the state. You're not violating the law when you do it. So it's a, sick, it's a sickness that uh, is part and parcel of uh, the way we've allowed ourselves to be taught by the ignorance of religious fanatics and superstitious people who claim the Bible says things which it doesn't say. And uh, I hope that by looking at some of these shocking things, we can kind of lay at the doorstep, uh, you know, where this belongs and try to move away from allowing our children to continually be subjected to the fear and the guilt and the horror of organized religion, especially girl children. I don't believe a girl child should set foot in a Christian church. Thank you very much for sharing this time and a um, little bit shocking, but not too much. The best is yet to come. Bye-bye.